What's going on, guys? Uh, Jamie Shaw here with the Absolute Basketball Company. Uh, very excited to have uh, J.D. Powell from the College of Charleston here with us today. Uh, he's going to talk about lifelong learning, uh, ways to continue and keep growing as a coach once you're already in the profession and, and continuing to grow. Um, a little bit about J.D. Uh, he graduated from Clemson and then went on to be a, a manager at Furman. After being a manager at Furman, he's had stints at Charleston Southern and Citadel. And now he's at the College of Charleston with Earl Grant. Uh, love and life coaching pros down there. So uh, very excited to have JD on board here. Very excited to hear what he has. I know this is a very passionate topic for him um, and all that stuff. And I went through his notes earlier and I'm very excited for you guys to listen to. Uh, we're going to let him present for probably, uh, you know, however long he takes. And then after that, he's going to open it up to questions. And it's going to be a free form uh, question and answer at the very end of it too. We're going to be able to let you control yourselves, you know, unmute yourself and just go ahead and jump on and, and, and go one at a time in that manner. So, uh, without further ado, here is Coach J.D. Powell from the College of Charleston. I appreciate it, Jamie. Uh, uh, Jamie, if you'll give me uh, some control on the screen, I got a couple of things I'm going to show as we get a little bit later into it. And then, uh, and then one thing that I do want to do, you know, you got to jump in at any point. You know, I, 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 when we do stuff like this, I love it whenever it just gets to be more of a dialogue, you know, and a sharing of ideas that type of thing. And so uh, if you got something to add, uh, jump in. You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, whenever Jamie and I first started talking about this about two weeks ago, it was really one of those things where we wanted to try to get outside the box a little bit. You know, I know we've all done a, a lot of clinics over the last, really feels like a year, but the last two months and just hearing different ideas. And uh, lifelong learner is a phrase that I got from Kevin Eastman about 10 years ago, and um, it's just something that I really enjoy. And so I, I pitched the idea to Jamie. I said, hey, let's change it up a little bit. Let's do something a little outside of basketball. And let's just talk about how we grow as coaches, you know, and, and, and how we grow as, as people and as professionals. And um, so just wanted to – I wrote down some ideas. want to share some things about some experiences that I've had and uh, some different ways that we try to learn within our program, whether it's watching other programs – learning within our own program and then some ways we can learn outside of basketball. But then also anybody, you know, like I said, if you got anything, um, jump in there and, uh, and, and, and share what, you, what you're thinking. I've been in college basketball now. I just finished my 18th year as a coach. And uh, as I said, back in 2010, I was at Coaching U for the first time out in Las Vegas. And it was the first time I'd ever heard Kevin Eastman speak. And uh, most of you know who Coach Eastman is, longtime college coach, longtime NBA coach. And uh, it was unlike any clinic I had ever been to before. It was very detailed and precise. It was uh, Coach Eastman comes with a lot of bullet points. And when the day and a half was over, I had 56 pages of typed notes. And uh, just really blew my mind and kind of got me on this journey of just how do we continue to learn? And uh, as I turned 41 back in April, I just, I'm a big believer in that we got to continue to grow and learn. You know, as you really think about our game, the style of play is always changing. Player development is constantly changing. Recruiting is changing. Obviously, the rules and, and how we can recruit are changing. How we evaluate is changing. You know, all those things are constantly on the move. And so, you know, one of my favorite things I heard somebody say is once we think we've got it figured out, uh, then we need to go find something else to do because we're in trouble. You know, we're a sinking ship at that point. So just, like I said, put together some ideas, some different things, and just ways to learn. The first thing when we learn, we got to have an open mindset uh, and we have to have a willingness to learn. You know, I, I believe that in every time we hear somebody speak, uh, we can take one thing, just even if it's one thing, from every single person we come in contact with. Uh, I believe that that helps me from just a mindset of, like if I'm somewhere and I'm listening to a clinician speak or, or even if I'm at church on Sunday or I'm listening to something, just trying to really concentrate in that. Even if I don't like what he's talking about or I don't always agree with it, there's something that I'm gonna be able to take from it. So just have, trying to have an open mind. Um, we had a guy that worked with our team for about four years. He was a character coach for us. And uh, uh, he was a pastor in downtown Charleston, uh, Herman Robinson. And he said something to me one time. He said, listening is one of the most difficult skills in life to, to learn. 
And uh, I can definitely attribute to that. I've got three little boys. They're 10, 8, and 5. And that's a big thing we talk to our 10-year-old about. He loves to talk. And we try to explain to him we have two ears to listen and one mouth to speak. And he'll always say, well, if I'm only listening, when do I get to tell everybody else what I want to say? And uh, just really appreciate what Pastor Robinson shared with me a couple of years ago of how hard it is to actually become good at listening. And that that's a skill we have to work on. We have to be intentional about listening to be able to learn. There's a lot of different ways that we can learn. Um, we're going to talk about two ways right here to start with. Uh, first, we can learn by watching others, and we can learn by listening to others. Uh, and as we talk about watching others, this is why I'd love to get some feedback from, from you guys. I think one of the best ways that we learn in watching other coaches is by watching practices and workouts. Um, if I'm traveling, if I'm on the road recruiting, um, if I'm traveling with my family, you know, if there's a team close by, then I'm going to try to reach out to somebody on the staff. And, and, you know, even if it's just a spring workout, a fall individual workout, and just see if I can come and watch. Um, been fortunate in the state of South Carolina. Frank Martin allows us to do that. Brad Brunell allows us to do that. Most of the time, I've found that if a team is not on your schedule, they'll let you come and watch. And uh, there's two things that every, every person, I think, is proud to talk about. One, they love to talk about their children. And two, they love to talk about their team. And so when you let them know you want to come and, and just observe and just be a fly on the wall, most coaches are, are willing to let you do that. Uh, I always think it's important to try to go learn one level up, too. So one of my favorite things has been to try to go to NBA practices, try to go to an NBA workout. I think some of the NBA clinics that a couple of teams have done um, during this, this time over the last couple of months have been really good. Because again, it's just, it gets us outside of our, our mindset. And then some of the best notes that I've ever gotten on drills and player development have come in high school practices. You know, whenever I'm out evaluating players, um, you know, just to see a different way that a coach did a drill or, or a way that he explained something, you know, I'll be evaluating a player, but I'm gonna write it down. And then I take it back whenever I'm going back through my notes after the recruiting trip and it, you know, it might be something I stick in the file or it might be something that I'll take to Earl Grant, our head coach. So I want to open it up to you guys real quick. If, if you got, you know, one or two guys that would just love to share um, an experience, you know, where you, where you went and saw a team practice and uh, whether it was an NBA team, a college team, a high school team, and uh, a, one that they really felt like they learned from. Anybody got one? One of my favorites is uh, I've gotten to go see the Charlotte Hornets work out a couple times. And uh, it's just great. Like I said, love watching NBA stuff right now. Um, obviously, they're the best in the world at what they do. And, and so it was just, it was really good. One of my biggest takeaways whenever I've been to an NBA practice is that us as college coaches, as high school coaches, that we're doing a good job. You know, nine times there and I'm going to see them doing something that's similar to what we were doing in practice and I guess it's more of just that reassurance that hey you know what we are teaching that the right way or we are trying to develop that skill the right way and so that's my first thing is go try to watch other people go try to watch uh, how other people do it and, and be able to learn from them I think the second way that we that we can continue to learn is by listening to others you know I talked about my experience guy sharing with me the importance of being a good listener um, but just listening asking questions of coaches so I'm fortunate in that you know because of scouting you know I get to see a lot of different teams play on film so when I'm on the road in April or I'm on the road in July and you know especially if it's a coach that I don't know that I want to build a relationship with you know if I've seen his team on film you know it gives me an opportunity to go and, and just if I'm sitting beside them at a game, hey, I saw this on film or I heard you say this, and then just let them talk. You know, I just try to shut up and listen um, by just trying to ask intelligent, thoughtful questions. You know, the one thing I would say is that, you know, if it's about their team, they, they're willing to share, you know, and so it's a great opportunity to just 
asks them some thoughtful questions. The one thing that I think is hard sometimes, especially for young coaches, I get probably three to three to four emails every day, you know, guys that, that are trying to find a way to break into college coaching. And um, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to connect. They're trying to reach out. But, you know, we are so relationship-based that we've got to find ways to build relationships and communicate other than just shooting off an email where, you know, the coach's name was just typed in and then everything else was the same. You know, um, I wish I had more time to read every single one of those emails that people send, but you've got to find ways to connect. And I think, you know, asking questions when you're around them going and watching a practice and visiting, you know, it gives them a great way to just be able to connect with somebody. And, and it's more than just that carbon copy email um, that, uh, that so many of us get. Kind of as we keep talking about listening and watching others and learning, um, I love to try to find other teams and other programs to watch and to learn from. Um, every season, you know, when we get started in November, when the NBA gets started in November, I'll pick an NBA team each year. And, um, you know, I don't want it to just, I don't really have an, a favorite NBA team. It's more of just picking a team. And what I'll do is on the treadmill each day, I'll watch them on Synergy, but I watch every game in succession. So I'll start with their first game of the year, you know, when it's November, and, and I'm pretty well able to just stay with them but I at least make sure I watch one quarter of every single game they play in order. And my reason for, for sharing that and, and talking about that is what you realize when you do that is uh, you learn that they make mistakes too. You know, um, you get to see the ups and downs that they go through during the season. Even the best NBA teams every season are going to lose three, four games in a row. And you get to watch them just kind of go through the ups and downs. My biggest thing that I've taken away from – I did the Celtics two years ago. I did the Jazz this past year because our guy, Jarrell Brantley, was drafted by the Jazz. But what you realize is how much roster change they have. You know, they might be in one city on one night and, you know, somebody rolled an ankle and then two days later they got to go play without a starter. And you just see that they are so much better than we are at being fluid with their roster and making adjustments and, um, you know, this particular guy is out tonight. And so how they adjust, there's, I think they're really better at that than we are. And they have to be, they play a lot more games. But whenever you can find a team and lock into them, uh, other than just a favorite team, just watching it for fun, you know, just being able to study them. The other thing that it does for me is, you know, I, I'm on the treadmill, I'm running, I've got their game on uh, and they may run in action and it might not be exactly the same as what we're running but they might do something within the action that just triggers my mind of something I've never thought of uh, for something we can do within something, you know? And so that's happened a lot over the last two years. You know, I might write something down, take it back to Earl and just say, Hey, you know, I saw this, you know, it's just something for us to, to think about. So it just keeps your mind stimulated, you know, and it just gives you different ways to uh, continually think about things. And then the last thing I'd say is we talk about watching other teams and, and listening to people, uh, I got started last summer with studying the EuroLeague. The EuroLeague is incredible. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, you can find it on Synergy if you have access to it. But, you know, watching them play basketball sometimes is just one of the most mind-opening things that you can do as a coach. You know, so much of what they do is it's just different. You know, and, and what's great is the team I picked – Last summer was CSKA Moscow. Uh, Kyle Hines from UNC Greensboro plays there. He's had a great, I think, almost 10-year pro career. So it's great to watch those American guys that have gone over there and had success. But just so much about what they do in the movement part of it. You know, it, at the end of the day, it's all basketball. But uh, it'll just open up your mind to some things that maybe you've never considered, um, just something that you've never seen before that we don't see as much in the high school game. You know, we might see it some in the NBA, but great story though. I had picked that team last year out of Moscow and then I get an invite for a Zoom clinic about two weeks ago uh, from a guy that's, that's doing clinics right now. And it was the head coach of the guy out of Moscow. And uh, so it was great. I, I loved it. Just to be able to watch him 
as a clinician. He's doing it from Moscow on a dry erase board. It was a lot of fun, particularly having watched his team a pretty good amount over the, uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, I'll open it up one more time before I move on. Anybody got any a great experience or a question, anything, you know, where they've had a team that they've watched or that they've learned from over the last couple of years? Uh, I'm moving along. So the other thing that uh, I enjoy, I try to do one or two clinics every year. Um, I really think that it's important to invest in yourself. You know, we are our greatest investment. And so uh, I try to do one or two per year. Um, I believe, as I said, we can learn from anybody that we hear speak. Uh, so just being able to go to a clinic or get on, get on to one online, I just think that it's really important. Uh, I think when you can go to a clinic, you get a chance to meet people uh, and coaches have a little bit more time to talk than they would if it was on the road recruiting or if it was at a game or something like that. Uh, two, of the, two of my closest friends are, are, are people that I really appreciate in coaching. Uh, I met them at a clinic two years ago, you know, and, and they've become really important people in my life that I really appreciate. But it came from just being in a small clinic with those guys. Um, you know, so just being able to get to a clinic is really important. When I go to a clinic, I try to handwrite all of my notes. I'll handwrite all of them, and then whenever I go back, then I'll retype them. Just the way my brain works, um, it helps me kind of recall it. Um, to just have it there that is typed out, I can go back and search it. Um, especially last year, I was down in Gainesville, Florida, and Larry Shiat, who I played for at Clemson, does an event down there. And I don't know if this is safe or not. As I drove back from Gainesville, I would uh, dictate my notes uh, on my phone. So don't tell my wife. Like I said, I always think it's important to study a level up. You know, NBA clinics, EuroLeague clinics, you know, things that, that are a, a step above where we are. Uh, and then one thing that I learned early on from, from clinics is that, you know, we can learn from anyone, but we can't implement everything. You know, um, one of my favorite things that somebody said is, uh, be who you are and teach what you know. Um, you know, I'm an assistant coach. I'm not the head coach. Earl Grant is our head coach. Uh, I make suggestions. He makes decisions. So, you know, I have to, and I've been with him now for six years, I kind of know what he's comfortable teaching, what he's comfortable with us teaching. And so while I might have some great idea that I got at a clinic that I'll file away, you know, also have to know that, you know, uh, ultimately it's, it's up to him whether or not he wants to implement it. And it's got to be something that we're comfortable teaching. I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make is that we learn something, we learn a skill or we learn an action or a defense, and then we go try to teach it. Your players can, they'll, they'll, look, they'll look through that real fast if you don't know what you're talking about and if you haven't really thought it through. And then going back to the head coach thing, as I said, being an assistant coach, I know that I have to be respectful of his space. I have to be respectful of his mind space. I may have this great idea that, that I got, you know, that, I, that I'm really passionate about, but at the end of the day, he's coaching his team. And, you know, I always say, I have to be comfortable with uh, a head coach using about 10% of what I actually bring to the table. You know, I think one thing that happens is a, as a young assistant coach, especially, we learn these things, then we try to take it to our head coach. And he's also got a vision for what he wants to do as well. So I have to be comfortable with the fact that I might take it to him and he's probably not going to use it more times than not. But as an assistant coach, it's my job to bring him ideas. You know, just keep bringing him ideas, keep feeding him things, and, uh, and ultimately let him make the decision on it. That's going to kind of lead me into this, the, this third point, you know, I'm going to talk about how we learn at the College of Charleston from our own team, some of the things that we do, and, and particularly as we bring stuff to our head coach. But as we talk about learning from people outside of our program, we really believe at the College of Charleston, we can learn from, from our own team as well. Uh, we do that through our film breakdowns during the season, and then we do a lot of film breakdown after the season uh, of, of that team from the previous year. 
couple of things to think about as you're studying your own team, you're trying to learn from your own team. The first thing that comes to my mind is be consistent. You know, whatever you start doing at the beginning of the year, do it at the end of the year. One of the things that I learned when I was younger was I had these great ideas of all this stuff that I wanted to do with post-game film breakdown. And I'd stay up till two and three in the morning and doing all this stuff. And, and, and I, I couldn't sustain it, you know, over four months and 35 games. And so as I started off really strong, you know, I couldn't finish. And uh, so I think it's really important to whatever you start to finish, but you got to be smart about it. You know, you got to be um, intelligent about whatever I want to do this year uh, for my film breakdown, that I do it from start to finish. So the thing that I started about five years ago with Earl um, and, and Jamie, I'm going to try to show this sheet of paper if I can, is uh, Earl gets a piece of paper every day, I'm sorry, the next morning after each game. So I'm going to find this right here real quick and show you guys. We call it our post-game standards. And it is just something that we provide to our team after each game that's uh, – it's just kind of our standard for winning. And so let's see if I can pull this up real quick. We um, – I will get this together for Earl the night before. And, uh, again, it's just something I slip it under his door. So here we go. Can everybody see that? So this sheet right here, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger, is this is our post-game standards. This is something that's really become a big deal for us at the College of Charleston. We really feel like if we hit our standards, we win. Um, as we talk about the consistency of it, I slide this piece of paper under Earl's door every morning after every game. We start with our standards at the top, you know, with some different things that we evaluate and grade contest percentage, defensive rebounding, bricks, which is just consecutive stops, assists, turnovers, and then offensive rebounding percentage. We've messed with adding deflections a little bit this year, but uh, didn't fully do that. So those are our standards, you know, and uh, this is from a game against Delaware this past year, um, which I think one of their guys is on this call. So there you go, Pat. But uh, just some notes, you know, and then uh, below it, it's got, you know, three things we did really well defensively and three things we did well offensively. It's short to the point, you know, like on that sheet right there, it was important to me that um, I highlighted one of each thing. Cause again, if I can get him to take away one thing, that's the one thing that I want him to remember. And uh, so we do that after every game um, because we do that. It just it gives us something to be able to go back to. It's amazing now as we're doing our off season stuff, how often I'll go back to those sheets. I've got them from every game for every opponent to just be able to go back through some stuff and uh, look at some different numbers, look at what we did well, what we didn't do well, and, uh, and be able to break that down. The next sheet that I'm going to show is uh, how we get to our post-game standards. So this is our possession sheet. This is something that I'll do. I'll try to get started as early as I can after a game um, so that I can try to get you know, to bed at a decent hour. But this is just – this is page one of every single possession offensively and defensively. So you'll see clip one, possession offensively, possession one, result, and then, and then the action and the notes. I'll do this first to then just go back to our standard sheet, and that's how I accumulate my information. You know, I just look for different things that happen two and three times in a row. Uh, we're really big into trends. You know, we look for things that did it happen three times in a row. You know, we get three consecutive stops. We call them bricks. Um, we believe that we win 90% of the games whenever we get three stops in a row. So that's my first thing after every game. You know, when we're trying to study our team and, and learn from our team, uh, I'll do that possession sheet. Um, can normally knock it out in about an hour and a half, and then I'll use that sheet to create our standard sheet. You know, we use those standards to share with our players and, and put some notes together. Again, those standard sheets have a few bullet points on them um, and uh, just try to give our head coach, Earl Grant, a couple of ideas. It's always important to provide a solution, not just, a pro, uh, not just to point out what's wrong. I always love to say it's, 
it's easier to break a window than it is to make one. You know, anybody can identify a problem. Give me a solution. You know, and so I try not to just be a, an identifier of problems, but also to provide him with a solution. One last thing that I am going to share is um, we do this after every game. We track every offensive possession throughout the season. Again, it's just another way we can try to learn from, from what our team is doing, uh, from what's going on. And uh, this is really small. It's hard to read. But uh, to the left side is every offensive action that, that we have. You know, last year we, we ran 52 different actions at the end of the year. But I show this right here is that, you know, I, I enter this information after every single game. And we refer to this throughout the year. We call it points per possession. Um, we'll take an action and, you know, about once per month, I'll give Earl a, a printout of the top 10 actions that we're running based on points per possession. And then I'll give him the 10 worst actions point per possession once. But it just gives us a tool to just, you know, hey, what are we, what are we primarily scoring out of right now? But where it's really helpful to us too is after the season. You know, we just finished our offensive uh, postseason analysis last Friday. We went through, um, as I said, we had 52 actions at the end of the year that we ran. I'm looking for, you know, what actions did we run more than a certain number of times? Which ones did we, did we not? What we learned through all that is the actions that we don't run as much are typically the ones we don't work on as much and we're not very good at them. You know, so we talk about trying not to waste those possessions and just trying to run a few things really, really well. But as uh, Jamie alluded to, this, whenever they do have the NBA draft, we're going to have our third guy go to the NBA this year. And for our team studying this year, it's really been about so many of the actions we ran were ISO actions for Grant Rillick, you know, and uh, so we kind of had to go back to the drawing board a little bit and say, all right, now what were we good at that wasn't for him? And so that just gives us a great tool, you know, as we kind of get towards uh, the end of the year, we use it, as I said, monthly within league play, you know, what are we, what are we effective in? You know, how, what are we scoring out of? And, uh, and just try to help our team improve. One of the biggest for us is in transition. Um, I track as part of those possessions, how many of those were transition possessions, how many points did we score in transition and how many times did we turn it over? Um, because when we're at our best, you know, we need to be able to knock some basketballs away defensively and, and go lay it in. And that is just another tool for us to be able to track that. You know, how much are we getting into transition? Uh, so we use that a lot to uh, try to just learn from our current team, you know, learn from our past team this past year. And as I said, now we're kind of getting into preparing for next season. And, you know, what can we do to uh, – where are we going to have to do offensively next year without a guy like Grant Miller to be able, uh, to, be able to share that? Uh, Coach Huff, yeah, I'm going to put that, that first standard sheet back up there. Uh, here you go. As I'm showing that right there for a second, that's going to kind of lead me into our last topic. You know, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we can learn off the court. And uh, uh, Coach Huff, there's that. If, if you need me to send that to you, just let me know. Just send me an email address and, and I can shoot it to you. As, I, as again, as I said, I just think being a lifelong learner, learner is really important for all of us. You know, uh, I'm a parent, uh, I'm a dad, and a coach as well. I think being a dad has made me a better coach, and being a coach has helped make me a better dad. Living in Charleston, South Carolina is, uh, is obviously a fantastic place to learn, but we have some great organizations and businesses. And so I always think one of my favorite things in the summer, it's important to go find a really successful business that uh, you can learn from and just pick their brain. You know, you'll, you'll be amazed at the similarities. One of my favorite examples in Charleston is, is a restaurant called Hall's Chop House. You know, uh, there's one in Columbia. Coach Dieter's probably there about once a week. But uh, as I started spending time with those guys that own it, one of the things that I really took away, when you go to their restaurant, it's not about – just the food and, and, and the eating of food. It's the experience while you're there. You know, my wife and I, we call it, you just leave happy. You know, you, you just leave happy. 
And whenever I really spent some time with the, the family that owns it, it was amazing how much team building they do, just like we do with our basketball teams. You know, they do an exercise almost every day where uh, they gather everybody that's in that line call or that shift and, you know, they just share some type of life experience or they'll share something that's really important to their organization or just some, something to try to drive communication. And I think that studying companies, studying industry outside of basketball is really, really good for us because it can, again, open up our mind to something completely different. Um, Boeing in Charleston, South Carolina, is it, now the largest Boeing facility in the country. Um, their former CEO is a part of our men's basketball legacy group. And so any chance I can go sit beside him at one of our luncheons, I'm, I'm going to do it. You know, and I just love listening to him. Boeing has been through so many struggles over the last couple of years that, you know, they go through ups and downs just like we do with our teams. And uh, to be able to listen to them talk about what they go through their experiences, we can, we can learn from that with our basketball team. And I think, that that's, I think that's really important. Second thing I'd say is just finding a mentor outside of basketball. I, I'm a big believer that we've got to have people in our lives uh, that have something going on other than basketball. Some of my closest friends are, are people that I don't want them to want to talk about ball screen defense. You know, talk to me about what's going on with your kids. Talk to me about what's going on with your business but just some people that I can gain some balance from, um, that I can learn from, I think is really important. And then the last thing I was gonna touch on right here um, is, is reading and, and listening. Um, I'm not like some of the, you know, you get on some clinics, coaches talking about all these books that they read. I'm not a great reader, I try to. I try to read for the last 10 or 15 minutes before I go to bed, mainly because I can't sleep and it helps my mind to slow down, but. I'm really big into audible.com. You know, when I drive, when I travel, um, you know, I've downloaded a book and, uh, and I can get through it pretty quick. You know, it, that's easier for me than just sitting down and being able to read. Uh, so obviously, you know, just reading, listening uh, can really help open up our minds to being a lifelong learner. What I try to do with my books is I'll go one leadership book and then I'll go something that is just completely off topic. You know, doesn't have to do anything with leadership. So my favorite book, uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear, is an unbelievable book. Uh, I've done it twice now. You know, it's just a book that really, you know, breaks down the, you know, being successful one day after the other. Just, just do one little thing well today, and let's try to do it again tomorrow. It's a great leadership book, but it's also great for team building, for team building, for parenting. Uh, and then from there, I did uh, Becoming by Michelle Obama. And uh, it's just, again, had nothing to do with sports. I guess you could say maybe it's a leadership book, but uh, it's just a great book, you know, to be able to have a better understanding for what their life was like and, uh, and to learn from them. And then I love, to, uh, I love to follow current events. You know, I'm not really big into commentary. I don't really get into uh, what other people think about the news. I just want to know what the news is. And so I just really think that reading, listening, is a big part of what we have to do as lifelong learners. You know, if we're trying to talk to our players and their families about what's going on in the world. We've got to be educated, and you know, and uh, and so I think that that's that's really important as well. That's really what I got, guys. You know, I just uh, wanted to share some things that I've learned along the way, just about ways to learn and to grow. Again, I'd love to hear any any ideas or anything anybody else has got that they found to, to be effective, or, or if anybody's got any questions. Yeah, I have a comment, and I'm sorry for getting late. I was on a call with the, my job there earlier, but just catching the tail end of your presentation, um, how you read the book Becoming. I read it too as well. It was actually a gift I gave to my mother. Uh, yeah. We read it together, uh, you know, long distance. And also I saw the documentary too, also. So, and I'm, and I'm guessing what, what my question I'm about to ask you, do you see what kind of what I do a lot? I usually draw a lot of comparison within the coaching industry and also the business environment, right? Because yep. a lot of times you hear the CEOs and directors and VPs get on and make, do those type of TED Talks type of discussions, and they're kind of discussing a lot of the different same things as far as leadership, having a good team, having teammates, having somebody that could contribute in this kind of, in this kind of aspect. So is that something that you do? Because I know when yep. I do that, when I compare the coaching industry, coaching the team, I do the same thing 
in the corporate professional environment too. And I found that when they're similar, then everything kind of parallels with each other and try to yeah. incorporate some of the things that have incorporated into the basketball part of it and vice versa. I think so. I mean, I think it's just huge. You know, I think that being able to learn from those guys is really, really important. Um, I think it's really similar. You know, I, it's, it's just, uh, there's a lot of the same type things going on. You know, it's just that, you know, we do it in a ball game in front of, you know, however many people at our game, whereas they're doing it in the boardroom and, and impacting stockholders. And so I would hundred percent agree. I love that stuff. I love the opportunity to be able to, like I said, living in a city like Charleston, we have a lot of great organizations and companies, particularly restaurants. The restaurant industry in Charleston, South Carolina is, if you're not great at what you do, you won't last more than about two months. And so I love just being around those guys, hearing them talk about what they're doing with their team, how they're helping them grow. And, and you said it, you know, there's so many similarities. There's so many things that you see that they do with their team um, from just the communication to sharing a vision to sharing life experiences together. Um, I went to Chick-fil-A about five years ago, and Chick-fil-A's motto, they call it doing life together. You know, they want it to be, they know it has to be bigger than just selling chicken. That if, if that's all that I'm worried about when I show up to work, I'm not going to be very good at it. Whereas if I can build a relationship with the person that's working next to me, um, and, and we can find a, a common ground and being passionate about it, then we've got a chance to be great. And, uh, and Chick-fil-A is a group that, that, that is really on the forefront of that. But I 100% agree. I think it's a great place to go to learn is to get outside of sports sometimes and, uh, and, and be able to learn that way. I appreciate hey, that. Who, who are some peers uh, and other coaches that you really take from and, and continually try to study and, and learn from and, and stuff? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so, Jamie, my favorite guy is, uh, is Chuck Martin at South Carolina. You know, um, Chuck is a guy. He's actually the one I met. We met at a clinic about two years ago and um, just kind of been – he's just one of my kind of go-to guys. You know, I, I love – Picking Chuck's brain, he spent a little bit of time in the NBA. He's been a college head coach, you know, and so probably that's the guy that I, I, I probably uh, enjoy that with the most. And then to be honest with you, it's just I feel like you can learn from anybody, you know. And so, you know, even in the conversations that you and I have, you know, and, and I listen to what's going on in your world and what your evaluation process is, you know, all those types of things, you know, those are all things that 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 I feel like I can take from, you know, I'm just always trying to listen and, and learn. And, and then finally, I got really fortunate when I was at Clemson playing for Larry Shiat. Uh, Larry Shiat is now retired from college basketball. He's retired from the NBA and he's really passionate about trying to give back to coaches. And uh, so coach Shiat does a great job with his clinic um, down in uh, Gainesville, Florida. And, and he's just a, a great resource um, to be able to talk to as well. Coach Cabral Huff here, Holy Innocence High School. I got what's going on. I got two questions for you. What yeah. would you, what would your what would today's coach tell the younger coach uh, who was getting into the business? And the second part is I listen to Earl a lot. I actually listened to Jamie's podcast with him uh, today uh, about the four tough mentality. What what can you speak more into that? Yeah. You guys were yeah. that. Yeah, let's go with the second one first. You know, so Earl. Um, I've known Earl for 20 years, and um, we met when I was finishing up at Clemson. He was finishing up at Georgia College as a player in Milledgeville, and we both went to the John Crest basketball camp to be camp counselors, and we randomly got paired up. We were roommates um, at, at, at camp at the College of Charleston 20 years ago, and um, Earl Grant is a North Charleston guy that went to Stahl High School. He loves to say he came up the rough side of the mountain. You know, wasn't easy for him. Nobody gave him anything. Um, went to junior college, and he loves to tell our team about once every week or two that, you know, he went to North Georgia. I'm sorry, he went to Georgia College, but he was going to make that there big time. And uh, so that Ford tough mentality for, for us and for him is really just, it, it goes back to our core values, but really just a spirit of humility, a spirit of industriousness you know, a spirit of honesty, you know, just somebody that wants to go to work every single day, 
you know, um, Earl, we are what our life experiences are, you know, and so Earl is, is the son of a really hardworking guy in North Charleston, South Carolina. I'm the son of a dairy farm, you know, and so for us, that Ford built mentality is just somebody that is not afraid of hard work, not going to back down, um, you know, to brag on our program. We've had some success of being able to beat, you know, teams that are quote unquote higher level, you know, whether it was LSU or, or fill in the blank, Providence, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with our mindset. So that's really where that comes from. If I could go back and tell my younger self something, you know, and I, I, I've shared this with guys as I talk to them, whether it be recruiting or, or young coaches, it's just the value of every single relationship we come across. I got really lucky, man. So I was, I, I knew I wanted to coach when I was young, but I wasn't good enough to be able to play at a high level. So I went to Clemson to be a manager. And I got lucky. They, I got to walk on. And I didn't do a good enough job. I didn't realize how great of an opportunity I had to build relationships because I was a part of that at Clemson. And then as I continued on and, um, you know, was a young coach, I worked, I worked for EYBL for a year for Nike. And so I would travel around and I would work events that weren't open to college coaches. I would work Memorial Day Classic. I can remember being in New Orleans watching Tyler Hansborough and Lewis Williams go against each other. And I'm one of 25 people in the gym. And I wish I could have gone and told my younger self how valuable those relationships and how valuable those experiences were. Um, and, and so now just trying to do the best that I possibly can and just build every relationship possible, treat every person with respect and, um, and try to go from there. Thank you. Absolutely. What's up, Coach J.D. Manny here from Orangeville. Yo, what's up, boy? How you doing? Good. Yourself? I'm great, man. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Appreciate taking a few minutes. Uh, Coach, you speak about relationships. And, you know, as a future head coach now, you know, you're somebody that has a lot of different type of relationships to maintain. You know, you're talking recruits, uh, ADs, um, obviously your own players. How do you go about maintaining those relationships and making sure, you know, they're not just former relationships but genuine relationships? Yeah, you know, I, I just – I guess that's, first of all, it is hard, but um, it's just one of those things where when, if somebody pops up in my mind, I try to shoot them a text. You know what I mean? Of just whatever it is. Um, you just, whether you see a, you see the score on the night where one of your buddies won. Um, my thing that I've tried to do this year is anytime I know somebody that got let go somewhere, I just try to call and check on them. And, uh, and then, you know, just from a recruiting standpoint is, just trying to have some sort of relationship with guys when it's not just about recruiting their player, you know, and trying to have a connection with them. And whether that's through just shooting them a text, um, it gets harder the older you get, though. And I say that because, you know, I've got three little boys that are 10, 8, and 5, and, and they really they fill a lot of our time. And so the challenge over these two-plus months as we've been at home is, you know, for, for the first half of the day, my wife was doing homeschool in, in, in our house with two kids while I had the young one in the garage because I'm trying to keep him out of their hair, but I'm trying to be on the phone at the same time. Uh, the most important relationships that I can have right now are with those four people at my house. And, and, and I've learned that during this time was how neglected my 10 year old was because I had spent so much of my time and my energy trying to help our players, which I have to do that, but I can't neglect my 10 year old to do that. You know, and so just trying to be intentional about it, you know. Um, when I'm traveling, when I'm if I get some free time, just just hit somebody up, call somebody, check in, how you doing, you know that type of thing, and, and just uh, try to stay connected from that standpoint. Appreciate it, Coach. Always, man. Everything good up there? You safe? You good? Safe and sound. Yep. <laughs> good deal, man. Good to hear. JD, y'all, uh, you said that y'all use a lot of analytics and stuff in your game planning at the College of Charleston. What key stats do y'all hone in on? Like, if you know that y'all do these five things well, you're probably going to win the game or have a good chance. What key stats do y'all hone in on when y'all uh, analyze analytics? Yeah, so I'm going to go back to that standard sheet that I was talking about earlier, if that's all right, Jamie. So as you look right here on this sheet, this was from when we played Delaware. It was the next to last game of the year. I don't know if Pat Rogers is still on here or not, but he's one of my best friends. He's, he's on the staff up at Delaware. We were fortunate to win that day. We shouldn't have. But – these top, really, what is that, six standards are 
you know, kind of six that we have locked into at the College of Charleston where we say if we can, we don't have to do all of them to win. But when we do these things, we're really, really good. And those standards are our contest percentage, our defensive rebounding percentage, our bricks, which are three consecutive stops, our assists, and our turnovers. Offensive rebounding and deflections are kind of that next level. We don't focus on that as much as we do the other ones. But within those six right there, the biggest one is bricks. Um, you know, coach asked something about, you know, Earl Grant talking about being Ford tough. And we, we weren't always very good at the College of Charleston. We got here in our first year, we went 9-24. It was the worst season in the history of College of Charleston basketball. And uh, we were trying to rebuild it, and we built it from just a defensive toughness mindset. We won a, a conference road game one year, 40-37. to 37. Um, But we know that if we can get seven or more bricks during a game, we're 96% of the time we're going to win. Um, and so that's probably the biggest one for us. We have a drill that's called the brick drill, where it's just four on four on four, and that team that's on defense – they can't get out until they've gotten four, um, three consecutive stops in a row without giving up an offensive rebound. Um, now, you've got to be prepared. That drill might take 45 minutes because we're not going to let them out until they, until they get it. But really for us, the biggest thing is, is, is that, that brick number. You know, when we're doing that, that means we're getting stops. Our defense is, is fueling our offense, and, uh, and it helps us from there. That's not really so much the, the analytical number that you were talking about. It's more that's just something um, – if you watch our team play and you're at the game, you'll hear people behind the bench or you'll hear players yelling out, hey, we need one more stop for a brick. Um, that's another brick. We've got three right now. It's just something we can always go to and talk about. But that's a number that's really, really important to us as we talk about, you know, us being successful. Getting bricks, uh, we're, we're going to be pretty good. And then kind of furthering that too, looking at practices and everything, J.D., what all do y'all chart and mark during uh, competitive practices that y'all have? The first thing we always chart is turnovers. So the last two seasons, we've been in the top ten in the country in taking care of the ball. Um, so if we're doing a drill, every time we reset to a new live drill, uh, it's where, you know, benefits of having large staffs, but you know, we'll have somebody on the side with a large dry erase board that's, you know, big enough for everybody to see. And if it's my team is the gold team, and Jamie, your team is the maroon team. And if I turn the ball over, they're going to write JD up on the board, and they're going to put a dash, you know, just like we would in elementary school. And if you come down and you turn it over, uh, we're counting. And uh, you know, whenever most drills are over, we're going to reset and we're going to we're going to count up turnovers. And uh, you know, we, we won't always run for it. Most of the time, we do. But that's really the biggest thing that we track every day in practice. I heard somebody say one time that as a coach, you know, we can really only be good at three things max. And, you know, for us, taking care of the basketball, you know, is, is one of those three things. And so we try to track it in everything that we do. And, uh, and if we can keep it limited to just take care of the basketball, get bricks, you know, those, if we can start with those two things that we chart in practice, the next thing for us that I'm, I'm fighting for is, is offensive rebounding. I feel like we've got to create easy possessions. We've got to do it through second chance points. That's not something we do a great job of. Uh, that would be my next one that I'd like to see us add. But, uh, but it's really those first two. Coach, um, <clears throat> quick question kind of pertaining to a little bit on adding on the practice there. Uh, one thing I'm always uh, amazed at when I do go watch uh, the few times I am able to go watch a college practice during the year mm -hmm. is the the pace of just everything that's going on. And then trying to relay that back to my high school team seems like I'm trying to speak Chinese to them. Uh, how, what are some ways that from the get-go you're able to, whether it's starting in workouts in the summer or in the fall, to make sure that they, those guys are, you know, getting from spot to spot, but then also even the drills, you know, dummy drills or anything like that, that they're going full speed every single time and not taking anything off. Uh, that's one thing I always take away is every single college practice seems to have that. How do I generate that to a high school level? Uh, you know, it's interesting that you talk about that because I think that that's something we all are trying to find a way to do. You know, um, I talked a little bit about our experience with our guys that have been NBA guys. And so Grant Wheeler is really, he would have benefited this year of going through the pre-draft stuff because we had two guys before him kind of go through it 
and could share from their experience. Um, Earl Grant has never closed a practice at the College of Charleston. And um, so, you know, a couple times during the year, particularly in the preseason, you know, we'll have a high school team, a coach will just bring his whole team and watch practice. And I just think that it's so eye-opening for guys when they can go and see that stuff, you know, just being able to see the speed at which those guys are moving and how hard they're competing. And then the other part of that, what we will do, I was sharing before some of you guys jumped on, we're in the process right now, was on the call before we got on here of what's our plan to get our players back in the summer. And it's going to be a two-part plan, our returners first, and then about two weeks later they're going to bring in our new guys. But what we would typically try to do in the summers is we're going to try to mix individual groups to where it's, you know, a couple of older guys and a couple of younger guys because we want the older ones to teach the younger ones. And uh, that's not always easy to do because you got to have a culture before you can teach a culture. But uh, I do think that that helps us, you know, whenever we can pair those younger guys up with an older one, um, you know, where we've got some guys that have really have gone out and seen it. And uh, it makes a huge difference in just being able to teach the younger ones. Um, one of my favorite things whenever I go to a high school, like I've obviously been to, to Coach Dieter's high school plenty of times to see his guys. And, and whenever I'm with one of those guys, like, like what he has right now, is to share with them, hey, during this senior year, your biggest job is to leave a legacy. You know, make sure that when your career is done here at, at your high school or at, at your college, that those younger guys, you taught them how to work. We had a guy, Joe Cheely, who's with the Charlotte Hornets now. You know, he was the greatest combination of really good player high character person and high level leader I'd ever been around. I'd never been around a guy that had all three. And what he has done to instill with our young guys of here's what you've got to go do to be successful is, is incredible. I mean, it's still a huge part of what um, is a part of our culture today. And so having somebody that, that can help lead those younger guys and then is willing to do it, and accepting of that responsibility is, is really important. It helps if you've got one of those guys. Hey, Coach, um, you and Jamie have both kind of touched on uh, coaching pros down in College of Charleston. And I think it's always, always super fascinating when mid-major programs are just like spitting out pros every single year. Do you kind of attribute that to you guys identifying those guys early in the recruiting process and being like, this guy is a pro, or more so your skill development in the system you play where you kind of just like let them go out there and play your game? Yeah, I, you know, I wish I could say that we uh, we are not responsible for it. You know, I, mean, I wish I could say that uh, obviously we played a part in it. But uh, first of all, with all three of those guys, we inherited Joe Chile. He was here when we got here. And then we recruited Jarrell Brantley and Grant Willard. But Jarrell Brantley was a guy that had zero offers out of high school, went to prep school. He came out of prep school with three offers, uh, Sam Houston State, Hawaii, and the College of Charleston. And, um, you know, for those of you that don't, I mean, he's a pro. He's a, he made himself into a pro. And so I guess the best way to answer that question is, you know, those guys worked themselves into being a pro, uh, not just from a skill standpoint. Um, Jarrell Brantley was like a 24% shooter from three as a freshman. I think he left as about a 36 or 37% shooter. But it wasn't just the skill component of it. It was really more about the lifestyle component of it. You know, those guys, um, they value trying to go and be a pro. You know, and, and it's been one of the great things about watching The Last Dance and stuff. Whenever you just hear Mike and those guys talk about, hey, I saw this and I didn't want to be like that. Um, so those guys, you know, our player development is good at the College of Charleston. I really feel like we do a good job of that. It's one of the things that Earl takes a lot of uh, really values. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff, just one coach and one player to help them address individual needs. But, you know, so much of that is, is guys making a decision that, uh, hey, I want to go and be great. And, and that is part of recruiting. You know, you've got to know um, what is important to each guy. You know, we're, we're in a city where in Charleston, South Carolina, you know, our arena is in the middle of downtown. Um, it's unlike any other really campus in our state, at least. And so, you know, we have learned through recruiting that if it's a guy that's not about basketball and want to be great at it, they're going to get distracted pretty fast with being out downtown. And, uh, and it's important. We have, to, we have to make sure we ask the questions in the recruiting process to, to learn, you know, what do you want to go try to do? You know, um, you're just trying to, to, to show up and wear a jersey or are you trying to go be great? And uh, so a lot of it ultimately is about them making a the decision to, to then be great. 
Awesome. Thank you, Coach. Absolutely. Thanks, Jake. I have a quick question, Coach. It is something I always wanted to ask a coach from uh, from Charleston. With all the uh, with all the challenges that has happened in that community over the past several years, uh, mm -hmm. from a political landscape, how have you all been able to keep your players kind of mind focused on just school, basketball, each other, you know, yeah. while at the same time trying to be engaged and be uh, be able to understand what's going on in their close environment there. Yeah, so it's incredible. So particularly, Coach, I mean. Uh, the Emanuel AME shooting is a block and a half from our arena. I can see the church from my office. And uh, I, I'll never forget, you know, we're getting ready to come up on the anniversary of that in about two weeks. Um, uh, I'll never remembering that day. And so I think the fact that Earl is from Charleston, it kind of changes things. We have something we always talk about. We always say it's about Charleston. And when we say it's about Charleston, it really means two different things. First of all, he's from Charleston. So it's really important to him. We're the, we always tell our guys, we're the only team in Charleston that's going to wear a jersey that just says Charleston. You know, and so understanding what you represent. Um, you know, in the state of South Carolina, obviously Clemson football is big. South Carolina football is big. But in the city of Charleston, it's about Charleston basketball. And understanding what you represent when you're a part of that program. Uh, the College of Charleston is the sixth winningest program in college basketball in the last 30 years. And so – when we say it's about Charleston, it means that, hey, we have to go represent what this city stands for. You know, that we have to be hardworking, but we, have, we also have to show love to each other because that's, that's what's helped our city get through so much of that stuff over the last six years. Um, but then we took that it's about Charleston one step further to mean that if we're playing to our standard and it's about Charleston, then it doesn't matter who we play. And I don't say that from an arrogant standpoint. We always try to say on our scouting reports, reports for our opponent, it doesn't have the opponent we play. It'll just say Charleston versus opponent number one because we really want it to be, be about Charleston. Just focus on what Charleston has to do. And whether we're playing Villanova or we're playing, you know, um, the Citadel, if we focus on Charleston, if they're good enough to beat us at our standard, uh, then shake their hand and pat them on the back and we'll go get ready for the next one. But when we can play to our standard, when we can be about Charleston, um, then we're pretty good, you know. And so that's a great question. Uh, that's something that's really important. There's a banner that hangs in our arena in remembrance of that. And, uh, and yeah, that's a big thing. Coach, as a mid-major program, has the, how has the transfer portal changed your recruiting? Has it uh, obviously keeping trying to keep the kids you have and then uh, looking out to people who are, looking for a new place. I'm sure that's had a big impact on recruiting. Yeah. Coach, how you doing, man? Everything good? It's great to see you, man. Uh, so the transfer portal is, uh, it's, it's different. You know, we're, we're learning from it. Um, we've been fortunate here that under Coach Grant over the last six years, we really haven't had very many guys transfer. Um, next year, we will bring back two fifth-year seniors, and I think those are the sixth and seventh fifth-year guys that, that we will have brought back. You know, and so we've been really fortunate in our retention. And I think a lot of that starts with Earl Grant and just the way that he takes care of those guys. Um, the transfer portal for us is really more of one of those things where we try to cast a strong net in recruiting the first time. You know, um, every year if, if, if in a normal recruiting year, we're going to go into July with 12 guys that we're really recruiting. And six of them are going to end up at a higher level. And um, – we're going to still recruit those kids really, really well so that knowing that a couple of them are going to transfer from wherever they are, then we've, we've built a good relationship with them. Earl really likes to evaluate transfers that he knew in the recruiting process out of high school. So that helps us with that. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't do well with guys that he doesn't know or he doesn't know their coach or somebody in their corner. But, you know, particularly we, we have been fortunate. We haven't had a lot of guys leave. And uh, I think one of the most important things in college basketball that nobody's talking about right now is retention equals success most of the time. You've got to have good players, but your players have to get older, especially as a mid-major. You can't keep running freshmen and sophomores out there. You've got to get to some juniors and some seniors and some fifth-year seniors. And, uh, and, and retention is a huge part of that. And so just relationships, you know. And I know you guys are facing it in high schools now. I mean, we're seeing so much transfer le at every level. Um, it's one of those things where I used to say it when I was a younger coach that once we got to this point in transfer stuff, 
I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it anymore because I, how much fun can this really be every spring? But we all adapt and we grow and we learn and, um, and we, we just have to keep, keep moving forward, you know, and keep, keep recruiting those guys. We don't do anything in particular, I would really say, in terms of like trying to self-recruit our guys. The biggest thing is we want to make sure that our players, when their family drops them off, you know, that first day moving in, that they know that our staff knows that's somebody's son. Um, and, and we, need, we expect to take care of them like, they, like they're our side. Appreciate it. Always, man. Be safe. We got time for a few more questions here, guys, if y'all want to go ahead and jump in. Good deal. JD, you want to, uh, I see you wrote it in the chat here. You want to leave it with anybody, how to, how to get in touch with you or any uh, open invites or anything? Yeah, uh, I put my contact information in there. Appreciate you guys doing that. I was able to collect all the ones that you guys have put, so thank you for sharing that. Um, as I said, you know, Earl Grant always opens up every practice uh, when we're in Charleston. So uh, if you're ever in the area, please shoot me a text. Or come through, come see us. Uh, you're always welcome to come by our program. And, I appreciate you guys giving me an opportunity to just talk about what we're doing down here. Jay, I appreciate what you're doing and, uh, and trying to connect coaches and share ideas. And, uh, and so hopefully there was something in there that, uh, that somebody will be able to take away from it. That was good stuff. And guys, uh, JD, thank you for, for coming out. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and all that kind of stuff that you have to do. I will uh, shoot you over um, tonight the uh, contact stuff for these people that signed up as they came on and everything too. So I'll shoot that over to you so you can stay in contact with them how you wish. Um, also, uh, <clears throat> be sure guys, there's gonna, not gonna be one of these tomorrow. We're gonna have one on Thursday. Tim Kane from Murray State's gonna come on, um, share his knowledge and everything as well. So make sure you check that out, 2.30. Uh, this is going to be posted, uh, JD's is gonna be posted this weekend on Saturday uh, on the Absolute Basketball Experience YouTube channel. So make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to that and, and be ready for that. And as uh, Coach Huff alluded to earlier, uh, we had a um, Earl Grant podcast, a uh, great talk with Earl about 50 minutes or so, just going through his time and what they're doing at College of Charleston and, and his growth, uh, you know, coaching under both uh, Brad Brownell and coaching under Greg Marshall and how that molded him and what he's doing in Charleston and all that kind of stuff too. So it's a great listen to the Absolute Basketball podcast. is on Apple and Spotify and all that stuff too. So check that out. But go ahead and register now for Thursday, uh, 2.30. And J.D., again, this is awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for checking in. Absolutely.